Hi and welcome to Building Resilience. The following is a conversation with Deborah Ancona. Deborah is a professor of organization studies and the founder of the MIT Leadership Center at the MIT Sloan School of Management. Her pioneering research led to the concept of X teams as a vehicle for driving innovation within large organizations. Another one of her focuses is the concept of distributed leadership and the development of research-based tools, practices, and models that enable organizations to foster creative leadership at every level. She is the author of the book X Teams, How to Build Teams that Lead, Innovate, and Succeed, and the related article in praise of the incomplete leader. Today, we discuss about resilience and how to apply her research to create organizations that are nimble and are able to maneuver in chaos. Through this podcast, we are bringing resilience research and practice closer to you. If you enjoy the content, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share your thoughts in the comment section below. Your views and your feedback are extremely important to the development of the podcast. Enjoy our conversation. Hello, Deborah, and welcome to Building Resilience. Good morning, and happy to be here. It's my great pleasure and really an honor to have you on the podcast. Well, thank you. As I said, it's, it's great to be here. I'm very impressed with all the work that you have done. Thank you very much. I have tried to read quite a lot of your research and your work. And what I love about it is that it's, first of all, very timely, but it's also very pragmatical and applicable. And one thing that I noticed is that you frequently talk about context and the external world. And my first question would be, what makes you focus on this? Yeah, good question. Um, context has been uh, a priority for me from very early on, and that's because in my earliest work, my my dissertation, in fact, uh, I was studying teams in the telecommunications industry, and we took all of the variables that were known at the time that were predictors of team performance. And we did a survey and we looked at all of those variables. So clear goals, clear goal, clear goals, clear roles, um, good ways to communicate in the team, to resolve conflicts, to build trust, uh, co cohesion in the team, all of the variables that are, are kind of our basic mental model of teams. And we ran those against self Satis or satisfaction with the team, team members' perceptions of team performance, and then actual performance, that is revenue brought into the teams. And all of those variables, what I call the kind of dominant model of teams, basically predicted ratings of team performance by team members, ratings of satisfaction by team members, and there was zero zero relationship with actual revenue. And so this, first of all, panicked me because um, as a PhD student, you don't want zero results. However, I actually got that paper published in a top journal, so that was good. Um, but, but that started the inquiry, really, um, of what did matter. And there are many, many articles that I, did, I wrote with, with David Caldwell really examining what did matter. And it turns out that what we had noticed, because I lived with those telecommunications teams for many months, is that what mattered was not only internal process, although those things do matter. What really mattered was the ability to deal with context, because there is a political context. There is a changing world, and teams that know how to manage that context turn out to be more productive and more effective. And so that just got me started thinking context matters. And I think that that idea that context matters has only strengthened over time because uh, we have a lot of data that suggests that the ways in which teams manage their context and individuals manage their context is important. And given that we live right now in a world of exponential change, the rate of change of our environment is accelerating over time. That ability to understand, map, and act in your context matters more and more. This is why I started with the question, because we live in the world that we might describe as a bit chaotic, 
right? There's an overflow of information. The changes are overlapping. There are more and more of those. We talk more and more about disruptions. And it feels like you are one of the few who's focusing on context. And you talk about not only teams leading in what I call chaos, but also leaders, right? Managers leading through uh, chaos. So tell me a bit about your research in this arena, teams sure. and leadership. Um, sure. Um, so we can start maybe with leaders. Um, one of the things that, that we discovered about leading in chaos is, first of all, uh, the idea, we, we call it leadership signature, your own unique way of leading. But the point is that during chaotic times, there's a huge amount of stress and anxiety for everyone in our organizations. It's just, it, it's, it's chaos is unsettling. Uh, and so we know also from research that during times of chaos and uncertainty, the craving for leadership increases. People want to know that there's someone at the helm of the ship steering in, in these troubled times. And so actually communicate for leaders, communicating their leadership signature, communicating visibility. I'm here. Uh, I might not have all the answers. It may be that I'm, I'm galvanizing multiple people to help find the answers, but, but know that there is a way forward at these uh, in these tumultuous times. Uh, another thing that I have borrowed quite liberally uh, from Carl Weick, who is the father of sense-making, uh, is sense-making. Uh, and uh, the data that we have looking at leadership capabilities suggests that um, even though, even though leaders, when they think about what makes a great leader, they think mostly about visioning, execution, and building trust. Those are the three top things that leaders come up uh, tell us makes a difference in leadership. Um, sense making actually has a bigger impact on leadership effectiveness. It, in fact, is like a driver, uh, which White said. Uh, White used to call sense making a springboard for action. Well, it turns out it's a springboard for visioning. The more you understand now, the better able you are to think about what to create in the future, the better you able you are to execute. Uh, and actually, sense making um, helps to predict trust. Um, so people trust people who have a sense of what's going on in the world. Uh, so in terms of dealing with chaos, um, leadership and sense making is is very Im important. Uh, and that's an article um, that uh, was written with uh, some colleagues, uh, Michelle Williams and uh, Gisela Gerlach. Um, so uh, we, we have that work. Uh, the other thing is there's an emphasis right now for leaders on learning, on having more of a, what Dweck calls a growth mindset rather than a, a fixed mindset. So the idea of things happen and what we have to do is not say, who do we blame, but really focus on what can we learn from this? How can we do better next time? Um, another uh, two things that we talk about in leadership uh, that I think are important here, uh, and then I'll move on. Uh, one is uh, the work uh, by a number of scholars on managing paradox, um, and that's uh, come out in our work as a predictor of leadership effectiveness. So your ability to not work in a either or, but more of a both and mentality. Um, the ability to say, yes, we have to uh, be effective and efficient. We have to think short-term and long-term. It's not customers or employees. It's how do we figure out um, solutions that, that are both and kind of solutions. So that's important. And um, one other thing I'll, I'll bring up is um, a lot of the work by, by Henrik Bresman on vicarious learning. Um, so if the world is tumultuous, then part of what you can do is, as a leader, look at what other people are doing. This is true for teams as well. So some of the things that we find at the individual leader level also replicates at the team level. Um, so this notion of, uh, yes, experiment uh, part of leading in chaos is experimenting with different modes of activity. But um, I, I feel like we're, we're, we push 
experimentation over vicarious learning, when vicarious learning is also a very important mode of acting in chaos. Okay, who's doing it? What's worked? How do we kind of then use that to think about what our next steps are? So that's leadership. Um, for teams, um, again, sense-making is incredibly important. Uh, ambassadorship, which is part of what we'll talk about when we get to X teams, is also important. Getting buy-in for what you're doing, getting a sense of how what your team is doing in its experimentation fits into the larger organizational set of priorities and directions uh, helps you to create new solutions to chaos, but keep those aligned with other parts of the organization. So those are all ways of being resilient because they help buffer you, they help you to act in that chaos. Um, and so that's that's very important. The other is, is flexible membership for teams. Uh, if you wanna be resilient, then okay, um, there's this change here. How do we deal with that? Let's get an expert in to help us, or uh, let's get some folks in from marketing if we're having issues with customers um, so that you have a flexible team uh, that enables you to move more um, uh, flexibly in that chaos, therefore enables you to come up with solutions. Um, and same thing at the organizational level, you want to build in that resilience and ability to shift. Uh, and there uh, we talk about nimble organizations. Uh, this is work with Kate Isaacs and um, Elaine Backman, uh, which is to say that you want to build or architect what we call the game board, your organization, such that you build these flexible teams, you enable individuals to experiment so that you have ongoing um, innovation that then gets funneled and provides the organization with a varied set of solutions to its problems. And all of those things enable resilience at the, at the three levels. How would you define the resilience? Is the ability to come back after a setback, uh, the, to bounce back, that notion of resilience. So I see it that way, but I also think about organizational and team resilience as the ability to maneuver in a chaotic field. A lot of the organizations, especially the old organizations, are quite bureaucratic and they're um, still siloed. Mm -hmm. Do they need to be dismantled? and rethought, all the architecture rethought, and then create. they need to create something nimble, or can they build a nimble organization on top of the bureaucratic organization? Well, and this is the, this is the big question of our moment, and I, I think we have lots of experimenting going on. Um, so um, I do think um, that what, in our nimble work, we call the DNA organizations, the organizations that were built later have a distinct advantage because they were built to be more resilient and nimble and able to um, switch gears. And if, if something doesn't work, they have an alternative ready so that they can move after a, a setback and so on. Nonetheless, we have a lot of big bureaucratic organizations. And so um, many, 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 many organizations are struggling through how do we make this transformation from bureaucracies to more, whatever you want to call them. We use nimble, but nimble, McKinsey talks about agile, talk about learning networked organizations. So many organizations are on this trajectory. And so you see, again, um, some trying to reinvent themselves like Zappos, just tearing out the old and putting in the new. Others are um, like ING Bank are also doing that, putting in a team kind of structure on top of or aside from um, the, the more bureaucratic one. Um, and that's, you know, the kind of um, work by Mike Tushman and Charles O'Reilly on ambidexterity. You keep your kind of old and then you build an alternative 
form of, of new. Um, and so many organizations are, are doing that. Um, others are actually trying to embed these nimble practices within the existing organization and using it within that organization as a way to push the older organization to, to shift gears. So the way that we approach that with organizations that, that we work with is again at all three levels. So helping individuals to develop their capabilities of sense-making and relating and visioning and inventing, but also creating these teams, X teams, which enable experimentation and thinking about new products, new business models, new ways of organizing within the firm. So you give them the job of innovation and then they come back and embed that in. And then simultaneously, again, helping senior leadership, the architecting leaders, to move to loosen things up, to give people more autonomy, to allow teams to form and reform uh, to what Amy Edmondson calls teaming, to enable teaming to take place, um, to create funneling systems so that all of the innovation that's bubbling up can get uh, funneled into the best ideas. Um, so, so I think the answer is, organizations are playing with all those different alternatives. Um, and it's very exciting. I mean, it's a, it's a very exciting time, I think, in organizations. Um, I know that um, I worked with a very old family-owned bureaucratic pharma company. And uh, there, was, there was a manager there, uh, relatively senior level leader who said, you know, we're, we're not going to, we can't sustain the way we're going because there's so much innovation in pharma that if we don't innovate soon, we're, we're going to be really left behind. And so he, um, created several X teams in his organization and they did a huge amount of sense making. They went around and they looked at, what is biotech doing? Because biotech is acting more quickly than we are. So what are they doing? How do they operate? How can we pull those ideas in? So they looked in, in really great detail. You know, what do their contracts look like? Who, um, who are their suppliers? How do they interact with them? Um, they also looked at pharma companies that were way ahead of them on the innovation scale. They talked to experts in the field. They looked at more uh, kind of nimble organizations in other fields. What do they do? How do they operate? And then they took that for all that information back. And this is important. Sense making is actually not just about making sense of your external context. You have to map it. Uh, Carl Weick talks about sense making as cartography. You have to say, what did I learn about how that organization is different? And then use that. So they pulled that in and said, how do we make that work here? And they were able to really shave off an incredible amount of time in the product development process to cut costs. Uh, and then they started exporting their ideas to the rest of the organization. Uh, and not everybody uh, took them on, but what you do then is a campaign of change to spread these ideas throughout the organization. You start with the people that are most excited and not the resistors and then, and then build. What are X teams? What are X teams? Um, sorry, we should have probably done that a little earlier. Um, X teams are, the X, X is not cross-functional. People always say, oh yeah, cross-functional teams. The X is not for cross-functional, it's for externally active teams. So most of the time, if I'm in a room and executives and I say, you guys have all created hundreds, if not thousands of teams. You've had an incredible amount of um, um, education on teams and how they operate and um, whether you've read it in the best-selling textbooks on teams or in corporate training. Um, so what makes an effective team? And what comes out is much like what we we started this this. Um, uh, podcast with, which is um, 
clear goals, clear roles, everything focused on internal dynamics, how members interact with each other, or is there enough diversity in the team? But all of our work, all of our research, and there are, um, I don't know, 20 plus articles uh, that have been written um, are all about how, in fact, teams not only have to do that internal work, they also have to be externally oriented. So X teams, their modus operandi is externally oriented from day one. From the very beginning, you have to be externally oriented because if you have an exponentially changing context, then you have got to, first of all, do your sense making. What's changed? Because if I use the mental model that I started with or that the team started with a month ago, you're going to be outdated. So what is it that's new and different? Do your sense making. Map your context. Uh, these teams are externally oriented. They reach up. They do what we call ambassadorship. Um, and then the third thing is they reach out um, to coordinate. And this is not just reaching out beyond the team to the organization. It is also reaching out to the larger ecosystem. Because right now, if you look at a lot of the innovation that is taking place, these teams are really the fundamental structure of these nimble, agile learning organizations. Um, they are the ones creating new ties with suppliers, understanding customers, um, creating new partnerships with other organizations. Um, and so an X team is externally oriented. They link the team, they learn from outside, they help to coordinate with and, and build a kind of external system, if you will, of moving some project forward or their business forward. Does this only apply to, I don't know, sales teams, product teams, marketing teams, or would it apply to finance teams as well? Great question. We've, we've studied sales teams, we've studied hardware teams, software teams, management teams. So uh, that's actually not our work, but others have, have taken the model elsewhere. Um, uh, management teams, it would, in this day and age, it it's almost every team. Almost every team has to do work outside of its existing boundaries. There are a few that are internally focused, just come up with some idea or whatever. But most teams, finance right now, uh, it's changing. The political the political world is changing. That impacts financial decisions. Uh, what's going on in the markets? Uh, what's changing? Uh, I know I, I did a project with the International Development Bank. The whole idea of how do we finance these countries that are um, facing COVID? I mean, they, there's just not enough money to go around. So they are now exploring public-private partnerships as ways to finance uh, these countries. So given the world we're in, I'd say it's pretty much a given that you need to do at least some external activity. Deborah, it's very easy to say as a theory. Do you have any practical teams, uh, practical example, practical tips on how to implement this kind of act teams and or how to enable them if they already if the teams already exist? Yeah. Um, so um, when I'm talking to managers, the ones who are most nervous and scared, I say start small. Um, start small just to get the the hang of it, as as it were. So. Even if you have a team that's very internally focused, you want to begin to shift their orientation to be more externally active uh, and externally focused. So first thing you could do is pick a stakeholder a week, let's say, and ask each member of the team to do just two or three interviews with, let's say you were customer, with a customer, okay, what do you think about our business? Uh, what do you like best? What do you like worst? Um, what are the challenges that you're facing that we might be able to help you with? Um, so sending everybody out to do one or two interviews with a customer and then 
everybody comes back, they bring their notes, they they bring in maybe recordings of what the customers were saying, why they're leaving or why they're excited, um, bring that data in and then use that to innovate. Uh, you can do the same things with suppliers, the same thing with senior leadership. What are their expectations for the team? You can do the same thing with um, a competitor that you think might actually be a good um, partner in something. What do they think about that idea or not? Um, and you can get your whole, not only your team, but maybe even junior members of your team active in, in doing that. Uh, so um, I know um, I always tell this story. My, my daughter was an intern at Lee and Fung and uh, which is um, a company in Hong Kong, and um, the senior level folks wanted to know uh, what what the current trends were because they're in fashion. And so they took the interns. My daughter happened to have been in New York, but but in New York, and I think I don't remember uh, Rome and Paris maybe. And they sent the interns, the, the summer interns, are not even permanent employees, out with their cameras to take pictures in boutiques, the, the hottest boutiques in the cities. And then they had them say, okay, what are the trends? And then cross, what are the trends that are local versus more cosmopolitan? And um, and then they, they got some answers um, that they couldn't have gotten really on the internet or, or other places. So this is something that can engage everyone um, particularly, I have to say, millennials who are bored being at their computers all the time. It's a fabulous way to, to get engagement and break. So first step is just start the process. Get people used to using that external muscle, if you will. And then um, uh, you can provide a guide. Um, and there, there are two directions to go in. You can either what I call exify an existing team. Uh, or you create a new team and give them a new set of directions. So that would involve letting people know you have to do sense making. So you got them started on their interviewing um, ambassadorship. Um, so often the team leader does most of the alignment up the organization, but not necessarily um, you can also have members of your team presenting to leadership elsewhere. Um, and coordination, you can get a lot of people coordinating so that you're sure that the inputs that other groups have promised and the exports that going out of your team are taken care of. So you wanna train people in those activities. And the other thing to do is help teams by breaking the process into threes. First you explore, you do all your sense making, gather your data, what does it tell us? Then you, um, Ex, let's, I'm going to use execute for the moment. Um, we use a different word, but anyway. Um, okay, what does that mean? Given all the sense making and building relationships and networks, now what are we going to do? How do we bring this forward? So, what is the vision? How do we invent our way forward? Given the information we've we've just garnered, how do we create again this new product, this new solution, this new other, and then? export it. All right. How do we get it into the rest of the organization? How do we find people who support us? How do, and, and you want to look at that early anyway, who are our supporters, our allies and adversaries, but then work to export the idea into the rest of the organization. So those things, training in what you have to do across the team, and then when you have to do it provides a structure, um, that enables teams and, um, you know, I, I, I don't I don't want to be in, a, in in any kind of marketing mode, but but we have written up quite a bit on the, the how to's. Um, there are articles written. We have an X team book, which we're actually doing the second edition of. Uh, we have a simulation that helps teams to to learn how to be an X team. So um, so there are tools to enable this. Are there barriers to X teams? from what you've seen? Uh, lots of barriers. Um, so um, uh, we did work at Takeda, another uh, Takeda R&D, another pharma company. And um, everybody agreed that, that they needed to be more externally oriented given 
the way that pharma has been evolving and how they needed to be uh, more flexible in that space. Um, but then people, well, I, I don't even know who to call. How do, how do I go out? Um, so one of the barriers is that people don't feel um, that they know how to do this. And so they are a lot of help um, around, okay, surely, again, two interviews a week, surely you know two people that you can call somewhere. And if not, let me help you find those people. Um, so, so that's one barrier. A second is uh, barrier is, well, we have, we have great people here. We're a great organization. Why do we have to go out um, outside of, and so there, there is that idea. Um, then you get the, um, the lawyers and the regulators and everybody making it kind of difficult, not because, um, n not because they're trying to be difficult, but because they're trying to protect the organization. Oh, if we go out there, they'll steal our IP or, uh, you know, we'll be giving away trade secrets or, um, you know, if we collaborate with them, then they're going to learn too much about us or we won't be able to be as competitive as we need to be in other domains. Uh, so, so a lot of change in mindset uh, needs to take place uh, in order to overcome that resistance um, because you're threatening people with their very own identity or sense of self or sense of um, this is my job, I know how to do this. Well, if I know how to do this and this is my job, why am I going to learn from somebody in some other company? Um, you know, th that's threatening. Uh, so all of those things um, take take place. You link X teams with distributed leadership. Can you talk about a bit a bit about the link? Sure. Um, so uh, what we found in our work um, on nimble leadership is that part of nimble leadership is distributed leadership. That is, there is leadership at all levels. Um, and so we, um, again, this is with, with Kate Isaacson and Elaine Backman, we found in the organizations that we studied these distributed leadership. There are the entrepreneurial leaders lower down who are coming up with these ideas, the frothy innovation. Um, there are enabling leaders who help those entrepreneurial leaders to think through what they're doing, to connect them to other parts of the organization, um, and also communicate strategic, strategic roles. And then there are, again, these architecting leaders. Um, so in essence, in those nimble organizations or distributed leadership organizations, the organizations almost reverse. You, you have to have a lot of leaders even lower down in the organization. So um, X teams help in distributed leadership because they become the vehicle by which those individual leaders can innovate. Um, and be entrepreneurial leaders. Most of what they do is come up with ideas, try to find other people to join them, and then they create an X team that links to all the different areas that they need to, to link to. They have to get their resources. They have to learn about changes in the environment. All of those things become the mechanism by which those entrepreneurial leaders help the organization in its ability to be nimble. We talked about X teams, sense making, ambassadorship, coordination, visioning, relating, inventing. How do we connect all of this and how do we make them practical? So we are nothing if not practical. <laughs> so all the people that I'm, I'm privileged to work with um, uh, are, are looking at practice. And, and so, um, again, we see these, the, the way to move forward, the way they're connected is that you have to have your individuals with the skills that they need, um, including, so it's not just the skills, it is sense. Our, our model is sense-making, visioning, um, uh, relating, inventing, and building credibility. People need to have those 
capabilities, but they also need to have um, what we call leadership confidence. If you're a psychologist, it's leadership self-efficacy, the belief that you can be a leader. Um, because in those organizations, um, if people don't believe they're a leader, then they're not going to step up. I mean, in bureaucracies, people are used to give me an order and my job is to fulfill it rather than to come up with solutions and ideas. And so um, it's not a simple process to get people to think I'm a leader. I can come up with an idea and move it through the organization. So that's a major cultural shift. So you need people who have that leadership confidence and the skills to move ahead. You need then those leaders to populate the X teams who are the engine of innovation, if you will, or the catalyst of innovation um, to bring change forward. They're also amazingly great contexts to develop leaders who can do sense making and so on and so forth. So both you need the individual skills to staff the X teams and the X teams in turn help to develop leaders who know how to engage in these activities. And then you need the game board, the architects to create a culture of innovation, to create the structures around which these teams can operate. Again, giving autonomy, um, um, and, and putting the glue on everything, which is purpose. Um, the architecting leaders also need to think about why are we here as a mechanism to pull everything together. Um, so, so that's how I see these things working together. You need individuals with skills and mindsets. You need the teams that are these structures to enable flexibility. And those two work hand in hand. And they are both part of this distributed leadership, um, nimble, we sometimes, because we're, we're X's, everything is X, so um, we call it an X org, um, this, this organization that is able to innovate and um, be resilient in the face of change. Um, pick itself, if one solution doesn't work, they have something else going on. There are a lot of small bets trying to figure out what's going to work in this environment um, as, as a mechanism of change. So it's, it's the individual, the team, and the organizational level all working in concert to create this, in your terminology, resilient organization. Deborah, your research goes way back, but in the past year and a half, we've been through this pandemic time. Did anything change in your view about leaders, teams, and organizations in this time? Anything that worries you? Anything that um, that is still unknown? Anything that you see beyond this time? Um, well, there are many things beyond this time. Um, I, I think, if anything, what this time, time has um, has shown us is that a lot of the models that we've developed are even more important now. Uh, that um, in some sense, because when we did this original research, we were learning from organizations that were ahead of um, the, the norm, as it were. They, they were the more innovative organizations because those were our sample. Um, we understood and learned about models that I think are extremely useful right now. So I would say all of those things, the, the individual capability model, the X team model, and the X org or nimble model um, are all really, really important. And we find huge demand as organizations want to, to embed this idea. Now, does that mean that everything um, is do we know everything? No, uh, <laughs> things are going so quickly and there's so much exciting uh, work going on, both at, in organizations and theoretically uh, in, in the research realm. Um, so theoretically, um, you know, Mark Mortensen, Henrik Bresman, um, Amy Edmondson, all working on new models of teams. Uh, and I consider myself part of, of that group as well, looking at how do we deal with a new 
model of teams, which is shifting membership, fuzzy boundaries, um, loosened permeability, multiple people on multiple teams. Um, so, so pushing that theory forward is, is really important. Um, uh, the, the work, um, I love, I love, I love the work by, um, Anita Woolley on, uh, how do we take new technologies like AI that can help nudge individuals and teams uh, to engage in certain activities and what works and what doesn't work. Uh, we have technology, but we have to really still learn how to implement that in ways that are successful for teams. Also understanding distributed teams. What did COVID bring? Instant people are all over and distributed and connected only by technology. So finding, for example, this idea of um, Again, uh, Anita Woolley and her, her colleagues, um, bursts of activity are more effective than just regular activity. So come together, co coordinate, figure out what next steps are, distribute work across all the members, come together. It's, it's these bursts that is the most effective pattern. So, so bringing temporal ideas back into, into the fore. Um, uh, these are all new directions that have to do with, again, technologies and how to implement them and use them. On the organizational front, you have a huge increase in what we have called meta teams, or there's a whole group working on teams of teams. Uh, so you see all kinds of organizations partnering, going back to pharma, Novartis and Takeda, rivals coming together during COVID uh, with regulators, with universities, um, with testing sites to speed the rate at which drug development can take place in this age of COVID. So you've got this new entity. It's, it's not an organization, it's cross organizations, and it's not a team. It's a team of teams or a meta team. And we have to really understand and learn how do we make those things work? That's a new mechanism of, again, innovation in these chaotic times. So it's a very exciting time, both on the theoretical and on the uh, organizational level. If you were to think of some reflection points, right? We kept talking about reflection. Uh, even when we talked about sense-making, visioning, everything else, we talked about reflection. If there were some reflection points that uh, business leaders, uh, HR leaders, organizational design practitioners could start thinking about or implementing when they talk about strategy, transformation, or business direction, what should they reflect on? Um, so... One of the things I think is very important to reflect on is, is, first of all, this idea of purpose. Going back to the question, which really has got to drive people and give meaning to people. Um, it, we're not just um, responding to our inbox. It's got to be for some reason. Um, so I I love um, uh, Herminia Abara and her colleagues uh, wrote a case on Sachin Adela. I love that case because where does Sachin Adela start as he becomes the CEO of Microsoft? He goes around and his sense making is about why should Microsoft exist? What purpose do we serve? And getting that right is incredibly important. Why are we here? Um, and it helps to steer people. Again, if people have more autonomy, you have to give them simple rules and purpose so that they can direct in within a frame. Um, so, you know, are we here to make money or are we here to serve patients? Th th that's a very different mode of operating. Um, so figure out purpose. A second thing for reflection is, Given that purpose, we can't we can't do everything even in to get in that direction. So part of what we have found um, is that great leaders provide then focus areas in order to meet that purpose. Here are three or four core priorities right now. What are the three or four things that we have to focus on right now? Um, and. Again, um, 
Satya Nadella is an example of that. You know, one Microsoft uh, diversity customer obsession, and also he talks about technology a lot. So, so this is what this is what is going to get us to the next milestone. So, also the idea of milestones. We might not reach everything in our purpose right away, but let's get to this stage. So, you give people some interim thing to move toward with some very simple rules or simple ways of organizing where they're going. Um, so I think, I, I think that that is a way to reflect on, first of all, why are we here? What are our priorities? And then I also think is a reflection is how do we organize for innovation? I mean, the reason that we we help organizations, uh, and, and I don't mean to say that we're the only ones, there's a proliferation of people working in this arena. So um, uh, let us be clear, we, we are one actor in, in the midst of many, but, but what are we doing is helping people articulate their purpose, articulate their priorities, and then figure out how to reshape organizations in order to get there. Um, so you can't just say, okay, here's where we're going and I'm gonna order you to do this. You have to um, really put the resources in to helping people to understand how to get there. Um, you can't just get annoyed with people because they're not instantly doing something that they've never been asked to do before. Although people are quite good. We've seen in the pandemic that in times of stress, people step forward and, and innovate to an incredible degree. But, um, but I, I think those are the three things, purpose, priorities, and then how do you step back and think, how can we reconfigure how we operate here uh, so that we can have those individual leaders working in more flexible kinds of teams in order to have more resilient organizations that can come up with, with new products, solutions, business models, et cetera. So what can be done from the bottom up? So it doesn't feel like always the organization is pushing this, but actually that people are willing and, and uh, uh, contributing to this. Well, so it's, it's a little bit ironic, um, but we find that some of the biggest transformations to more distributed leadership or to more you know, nimble learning organizations are actually top down by leaders who recognize that they you, you can't have the omniscient leader at the top anymore. And so we, we've got to make this change. So there is an irony there. Um, but certainly, um, certainly you can start by training individuals and those individuals often feel empowered to move ahead. Uh, but, but that said, um, there needs to be, this is what we we're back to where we started at the beginning. There needs to be a context, an organizational context that is open and ready for that innovation because sometimes it's not. And then, um, I actually feel like that then it's counterproductive to get people too excited if they're not able to do bottom up. Now, that said, you don't need the CEO to necessarily be on board. Um, I've seen teams make major changes in organization just with some allies on high. Um, and so they are able to push forward new modes of operating or, or new uh, products or whatever it is that they're trying to innovate on. Um, but it does require uh, on the part of the team, this ambassadorship, this ability to move, to create buy-in, uh, to get some senior level support, uh, to get resources, um, to show how this particular mode of operating is going to help the organization uh, to to be a better um, to be better in in the marketplace, um, whatever that marketplace is. It could be a nonprofit as well. Um, 
So, so I think top down works and bottom up also works, but it takes a lot of work to create the networks of support that are necessary in order to, um, not get pushed down. For sure. Uh, anything, Deborah, that maybe I didn't ask and you maybe wanted to leave the viewers with? I'm sure there is um, a lot that um, that I, I could have said that um, that I didn't. Uh, but I, I think um, I think we covered uh, most of, of these things. And um, again, I, I going back to your question of can it be done? Uh, I think I'm going to give MIT a plug here. Uh, the, uh, the mission at MIT is men's at manis, um, mind and hand. And I, I do think w we need to operate in that way, pushing the theory ahead, but also pushing the practice. You mind, you have the theory, but it also has to work. Uh, and so I, I guess All I would say is I encourage us to be working together, that is practitioners and academics, to make the theory more applicable, uh, to say, okay, um, if you want to... Um, If you want to do sense making, first open up your mind, then collect a lot of data from these places, then pull it together and map it, then experiment. That that's give people the one, two, three, fours that they need um, in order to take this theory and make it um, living action. Um, I talk about building it into your DNA of action, and, and that's really kind of what we want to do, although there will be some people who are only on the theory, some people who are only on the practice, and, and some people who, who help to marry the two. So um, that's what I would push at this moment because it's, it's, a, it's a difficult moment. For those who would like to get in touch with you, either from the practical side or, for, or more from the academical uh, part, how can they reach out? What's the best way? Okay, well, good question. Um, if um, if you'd like more about the theory and all of the publications, then I would suggest just looking at the MIT website. Um, if you have specific questions, uh, you can email me, um, ancona at mit.edu. Hopefully, <laughs> won't be too many people. Um, uh, and... I guess in terms of the practical side, um, uh, there is a company called XLead, uh, and you can look at uh, xlead.co, um, and there you can find more information about uh, a 360 tool, uh, the X-Team simulation, some court exercises that help organizations to determine whether they're nimble or not and, and prioritize going forward. So, um, so I would say, um, that, that those are the, the three things I'm happy to send resources. There are also courses. We have a lot of, um, uh, exec ed courses on this material and both live and asynchronous. Um, so there are uh, lots of, of resources again, both on the, the theory and the practice. If you'd like to send me any kind of links that I can share through either YouTube or LinkedIn, please share and I'll make sure they will uh, show on the descriptions. Okay, sure. Great. We'll do that. Perfect. Deborah, thank you so much for your time today.